Hello, and welcome again to Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Great Actors podcast. I'd like to remind you to check out my blog and website at Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Great Actors, and also now check out my YouTube channel at Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Greats. Today, we are going to be talking about John Gilbert. You can find clips from John Gilbert, including some clips from his talkies, on the website at Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Great Actors. John Gilbert, His Rise and Fall with Special Credit to MGM. Let's face it, there's a lot of myth and folklore out there about John Gilbert, but how much of it is actually true? I will attempt in this blog to clear away all the smoke and mirrors and leave you with a clear view of the real John Gilbert. John Gilbert's Rotten Childhood Seems there is little to debunk about this particular subject. John Gilbert had a fairly horrible childhood. Born John Cecil Pringle on July 10, 1897, he had the bad fortune to be born to a stage actress mother and stock company manager father. John's mother, Ida Adair, as she was known on the stage, was rather young and her first love was the stage. His father and mother divorced when he was young. John was constantly moved around, often had no friends of his own age, and rarely attended school. His mother paid little attention to him, sometimes locking him in closets for hours. Eventually, things did improve for him, as his mother married a man named Walter Gilbert, who made some effort to be a father to John. He was also finally sent away to a military school where he could have some education, socialize with people his own age, and engage in sports, finding he did have some aptitude in sports such as tennis and golf. His mother wound up dying at the young age of 36, John being only 16 at the time. Even so, his neglectful and potentially abusive childhood prevented him from feeling anything except anger and bitterness towards his mother. This dislike of his mother would, oddly, be one of the reasons for his troubles with MGM. Feud with Louis B. Mayer Did Louis B. Mayer hate John Gilbert? Why, yes, it seems he did. Did he get into fistfights with him on numerous occasions? Well, possibly... Was he secretly waging a vendetta war against John Gilbert to ruin his career in life? I don't necessarily think so, and I will explain. Let's try to get through this bit by bit. Here we have a young John Gilbert, actually referred to as Jack, toiling away in L.A., acting in bit roles, doing some writing and even directing. He does enough to make an impression on the bigwigs of Fox, and they sign him to a contract and start promoting him as a leading man. In his starring roles, he makes a nice impression with critics and moviegoers. However, he hates Fox. Jack is also the type of guy who easily makes friends and becomes a good friend of Irving Thalberg, young prodigy at MGM. Of course, Irving enthusiastically sings Jack's praises to Louis B. Mayer, predicting he will be the next big star. MGM signs Jack to a contract. Everyone's happy. Or maybe not. Jack is happy, he likes MGM, but Louis B. Mayer seems to dislike Jack. No one can really understand this because Jack is generally a likable kind of guy, nice and thoughtful. But apparently, Louis B. Mayer is some kind of an odd mama's boy. He loves his mother. He thinks mothers should be put up on pedestals and worshipped. We all know how Jack feels about his mother, and it's also possible that Jack likes to get a rise out of Louis B. Mayer. At some point, rather early on at MGM, Jack said something slanderous about his own mother to Louis B. Mayer. This caused Louis B. Mayer to become so infuriated that he actually decked Jack. Louis B. Mayer does seem to have a history of punching actors and directors from time to time. The bottom line is that because Jack didn't love his mother, Louis B. Mayer hated him and continued to hold a grudge for many, many years. But did Louis B. Mayer deliberately sabotage John Gilbert's career? And did he and Jack have yet another altercation at King Vidor's wedding to Eleanor Boardman? In time, we shall tackle this, but first we must talk about 
the great lover and the women who loved him. I fear some of you are going to be angry with me by the end of this section. After all, many of us, including myself, do so love a great romantic story between two beautiful people and don't care to have that bubble burst. But let us start at the beginning. Olivia Burwell, 1918-1921 It's important to understand that Jack was a very impulsive guy and a great romantic. He became infatuated quite easily and would generally engage in a whirlwind courtship that would sweep the lady off her feet. While still in this honeymoon-type phase, he would rapidly marry her. Jack rarely deviated from this behavior, with the possible exception of not always marrying the lady, not for lack of his own trying. Jack met Olivia early on in his Hollywood career. He was just a struggling actor trying to get by. He was living at a boarding house where Olivia lived with her family. He had quite a lot of downtime. She was a pretty girl and, well... However, when the dust settled, Jack and Olivia found themselves basically strangers married to each other. They just weren't suited and they separated after about a year of marriage. In any marriage failure, Jack was very quick to take the blame and would never say anything publicly against his wife, even if she deserved it. Quote, Soon there was no speech between us. She would not complain. Never did she whine nor cry out at my worthlessness. End quote. That's a quote from John Gilbert in the book John Gilbert by Eve Golden. Latrice Joy, 1922-1925 Latrice and Jack met at the studios. They were both rising stars at the time. Latrice more so than Jack, which proved to be a huge problem down the line. This time, Jack's impulsivity almost had him arrested and scandalized, much like Rudolph Valentino. As a matter of fact, it was exactly like Rudy, but luckily for Jack and Latrice, Rudy got caught doing it first. Like Rudy and Natasha, Jack and Latrice went down to Mexico in 1921 and had a quickie wedding. But also like Rudy, it had not been a year since Jack's divorce from Olivia. There was a law at that time not allowing divorce parties to remarry before the course of a year. After seeing Rudy brought up on bigamy charges, Jack and Latrice decided they had better quickly and quietly annul their Mexican marriage and make it quite obvious to the public that they were living apart. This did work, and they went on to legally wed in 1922. As I mentioned before, Leatrice was on her way to becoming quite a big star in the early 1920s, while Jack was still kind of finding his footing as a leading man. Cecil B. DeMille handpicked Latrice as a leading lady and would continuously cast her in his pictures. However, Cecil and Jack did not get along. Cecil did not seem to get along with too many actors. Cecil had the audacity to insist that Latrice move away from Jack and live separately when she was making a picture for him. Sadly, Latrice valued her career over her marriage and would do so, which was very hurtful to Jack. This would continue on throughout their marriage. Jack would then retaliate by hanging around with other women. Also, Jack's drinking was generally a problem as well. He was already a hot-tempered, jealous kind of guy, and adding alcohol to the mix did not help. In the mid-1920s, Jack began really coming into his own at MGM. He was getting good roles in quality movies with quality directors, despite the fact that Louis B. Mayer hated him. He was also thrilled because Latrice was pregnant. Jack could not have been more delighted. Two people, however, were definitely not happy with the development, Cecil B. DeMille and Latrice herself. As always with Latrice, her career was the most important thing to her, and she feared having this baby would be the end of her career. To be truthful, it didn't help. Now not working because of her pregnancy, Latrice no longer tolerated Jack's drinking and carousing with women as she had done before. She filed for divorce just before the birth of the baby, not even allowing Jack to be in the delivery room with her. She cited Jack's drinking as the reason for the divorce. This was yet another strike against him with Louis B. Mayer, who thought Latrice was a lovely, sweet woman and Jack a horrible person for treating his lovely, pregnant wife thus. It also brought a lot of attention to Jack's drinking, which had generally been on par with many other Hollywood folks in that day. Jack, as usual, blamed himself entirely and said nothing about Latrice being more interested in her career than her marriage. He said at the time, quote, The fault was 99 and 9 tenths mine, end quote. John Gilbert by Eve Golden. 
I do not believe Latrice Gilbert Fountain, daughter of Jack and Latrice, agrees with that statement. She wrote a biography of Jack called Dark Star, which showed him in a very kind light, even though she was raised most of her life without much contact with her father, and goes on to imply there was a great love, never really dying, between her parents. She quotes Jack's neighbor and friend, Colleen Moore, as having asked Jack who the great love of his life was, and he responded, quote, the one I love best was Latrice. She was the girl who really broke my heart, end quote. Now, before we get to Jack's next great love, the one I know you are all waiting for, let's catch up with his career at this point. Feature films. As I mentioned before, the mid-1920s were a high point in Jack's career. His first really big success was The Merry Widow, 1925, with Mae Murray. This film is directed by Eric von Stroheim, who was also much hated by Louis B. Mayer and another of whom Mayer allegedly punched. In fact, Mayer never wanted von Stroheim to direct, but was convinced he was the best choice. When May Murray came to him citing disagreements with von Stroheim, he was happy to fire him and replace him with Monta Bell. Alas for Louis B. Mayer, the crew didn't agree with this move and refused to go on without von Stroheim. Therefore, Mayer had to put him back on the film. So we see here an example of perhaps Mayer not having such absolute power as we are led to believe. There are some clips from The Merry Widow on the website. This film was followed by arguably Jack's finest role, The Big Parade, 1925, directed by the great King Vidor and co-starring René Adori, who was a friend and frequent co-star from their days back at Fox. If you see just one silent film ever, or just one film of John Gilbert, please let this be the film. Though not my personal favorites of Jack's, it is definitely his best performance. It's a real shame the Oscars were not around in 1925, as I can't imagine any performance of that year topping Jack's. This film made Jack a huge star and a household name. I have a video montage with numerous clips on the website. Please go and take a look and watch how Jack takes us on an emotional journey throughout the film. Jack was once again paired with King Vidor in his next film, La Boheme, 1926, his co-star being one of the most critically acclaimed leading ladies of the time, Lillian Gish. Lillian had come from the DW School of Filmmaking, it's not literally a school, and had enjoyed great success under his tutelage. She transfixed everyone with her beauty and great dedication to her role. She could pantomime the act of sitting at a dresser and brushing her hair, even though there was no dresser, no seat, and no hairbrush. Quotes King Vidor in his autobiography, A Tree is a Tree, quote, Her hair was real, but at times we began to wonder, end quote. Jack holds his own quite well with Lillian Gish, and this is a very well done movie. I have some clips of La Boheme on the website. He had another hit movie in Bardley's The Magnificent, 1926, before embarking on a film which would pair him with a young and yet relatively unknown actress with whom he would be forever paired in romantic lore. I refer, of course, to Miss Greta Garbo and the film Flesh and the Devil, 1926. Before we get to this alleged fairy tale romance, let us give a quick look at this film, which is my favorite John Gilbert film. Flesh and the Devil was directed by Clarence Brown and also stars Lars Hansen, another Swedish actor, which probably helped Greta as well. At the time of production, John Gilbert was a huge star, probably the number one star at MGM. Greta Garbo was virtually unknown. This is a movie well worth watching, not just for the Garbo-Gilbert romance, but because this is a beautifully acted film with a touching storyline. It explores the power of friendship over the power of love, and having the woman as the villainous manipulator is rather different than most films from that time. It was the first silent film I ever saw, and it moved me immeasurably and really began my love for silent film. It was, as one of my good friends likes to say, a life-altering experience. And I do have clips from Flesh and the Devil on the website, so please take time to go and check them out. John Gilbert and Greta Garbo, storybook romance. Okay, I suspect this is the part you've been waiting for. So much was built up through the press about John Gilbert and Greta Garbo that it's become this legend. But what is the real truth? 
It is true that Jack and Greta met while filming Flesh and the Devil, though they had seen each other in passing around the studio lot. Greta obviously would know who Jack was, being as he was the biggest star at MGM. She had also seen some of his movies, especially The Big Parade, and seemed to have a kind of crush on him, like a good part of the female population. I would also note that Rudolph Valentino had at this time recently died unexpectedly at a very young age. This left women grasping to find their new great lover, and no one fit the bill better than John Gilbert, so it was very natural that he would inherit that title and the hordes of love-struck fans. It was also quite common of Jack to, quote, fall in love, end quote, with his female co-stars. I would call this more infatuation myself and possibly a little of letting his characters imitate real life. It does seem he had trouble separating himself from his characters after films. We could perhaps call Jack a method actor in spirit. Stanislavski's system, though well known in Russia, was only just making its early rounds in the mid-1920s and was not yet prevalent among stage or film actors. Now, on the one hand, we have Jack, who has a habit of falling in love with co-stars, engages in this wild, romantic, whirlwind courtships, culminating in a hasty and ill-advised marriages. On the other hand, we have Greta, already with a crush on Jack, perhaps looking to align herself with a big, powerful star, and probably fairly lonely in a new country. To add to the pot, we have them starring in a steamy, sexy, romantic movie. It just seems inevitable that they should have a passionate affair. It also must be noted that Jack was very solicitous of Greta and very helpful to her in her acting. She was rather shy and reclusive, as we know, and could struggle with being watched by a whole crew of people. Jack did quite a lot to make her comfortable. Honestly, Jack did a lot to make her a star. Being linked with one of the biggest stars in Hollywood certainly did not hurt her career. It does appear in the beginning that they were in love and would make a lot of appearances together. Also, probably good publicity for Greta. She moved into Jack's house and would remain there for several years, carrying on their on-again, off-again romance. Again, this is how Jack operated in most his relationships. Eleanor Boardman and King Vidor's Legendary Wedding A side note of this wedding was that Eleanor and King were married. And I mean it when I say this is a side note. There was so much drama about this wedding that it is unreal. Let's try to rationally decide what might make sense out of this bizarre scenario presented to us. Two items are in contest at this wedding. One is that John and Greta were also planning to be wed and that Greta stood John up. Two, upon being bitterly disappointed by Greta... He had an unfortunate run-in with hated enemy Louis B. Mayer, who he subsequently pushed to the floor, causing Mayer to scream that he was finished in Hollywood and led to Louis B. Mayer sabotaging his career. Let's start with Greta and Jack. They were actually still in the process of making Flesh and the Devil when this wedding took place. They had known each other perhaps three weeks. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Jack should propose, of course, But Greta, though infatuated with Jack, was very clever in dealing with men. It was the start of her career. She would hardly want it to start out being tied down to a marriage, which might also change her career path. Also, to be legally married, even back in 1926, you still had to obtain a marriage license. These are public record and can be searched. There is no record of any marriage license between Greta Garbo and John Gilbert, nor under their original birth names. It is not something you can just make up a pseudonym for. You need to have your legal name on the document. That alone makes it clear to me that no legal wedding between Greta and John was ever intended on that date. Not to say some ceremony couldn't have been arranged, but it seems unlikely after his Mexican wedding debacle that he would be so careless about legalities. I do think Greta was supposed to be there with him and did not show up, causing him much unhappiness. She had a habit of not showing up when planned if she didn't feel like it, regardless of how it would affect Jack. This was a pattern often repeated, so I am generally skeptical about the double wedding claim. Second, old enemy Louis B. Mayer. Well, the story goes, Jack was in the bathroom, drunk and distraught, for whatever reason, and Louis B. Mayer suddenly decides he's going to commiserate with Jack by saying, of Greta Garbo, quote, Just sleep with her, don't marry her. 
End quote. This drove Jack into a rage, causing him to attack Mayer, knocking him down and slamming his head on the floor. Mayer then allegedly yelled, You're finished, Gilbert! Now, the only person who has ever mentioned this, claiming to have witnessed it, was Eleanor Boardman herself. Numerous people were at this wedding, many of who have written autobiographies. Not one mentions this story. King Vidor himself, in A Tree is a Tree, made absolutely no mention of either of these events, but does go on to recount a funny incident a couple days later where he and Eleanor had found an overturned vehicle near their home. They came to find it was Beatrice Lilly's vehicle, and she had gotten to Jack's house and was resting comfortably on his couch. They then went home, but it is implied that Beatrice remained with Jack and not just to rest. How odd that no one would mention this very dramatic incident that took place at a very high-profile wedding full of celebrities. Also, nothing happened to John Gilbert. He finished making Flesh and the Devil and continued on at MGM as their leading star. Some of his well-received films thereafter include Man, Woman, and Sin, 1927, Love, 1927, Again with Garbo, MGM used the relationship to entice people to go to their films, and The Cossacks, 1928. He was working in big-budget films with the best directors of the time, Monta Bell, for example, and was being constantly promoted by MGM. Also, it's good to note that in 1926, talkies are still a couple years off and not on anyone's radar, least of all Louis B. Mayer's, so he was not sitting there plotting to destroy John Gilbert's career by sabotaging him with talkies because of a fight. John Gilbert was making MGM quite a lot of money, and despite Louis B. Mayer's personal dislike of John, he was a businessman, and John was good for business. As for Greta... They did have an on-again, off-again relationship, and she did live at his home until 1929 when he eloped with Ina Clare. By then, however, their relationship was more a friendship rather than a romance, and her staying at Jack's was more for convenience. Upon moving out of Jack's house, for example, she chose a very modest, inexpensive hotel until she was informed that someone of her stature should be residing in a more prestigious location. Let's just call Greta frugal. John Gilbert and the Talkies If I've read one time, I've read a thousand times that the Talkies destroyed John Gilbert and that his voice was high-pitched and squeaky. Those in addition to the discussed Mayer story of John being finished at MGM. Let's please destroy all these myths now. Nothing was ever wrong with John's voice. Perhaps people had a weird preconceived notion what he would sound like. Also, in the beginning of the talkies, I think Jack was kind of lost as to how he should speak. He reverted back to his stage training and tried in his first talkie, Redemption, to speak that way, which came off very unnatural sounding. Redemption was actually shelved because the sound was poor. They really had no idea what they were doing. It also didn't help that new wife Ina Clare, a proficient stage actress, was constantly trying to have him speak in, quote, pear-shaped tones, end quote. I think he would have been better off just speaking as John Gilbert spoke. It reminds me of something I once read in Spencer Tracy's biography about a movie he was doing with Jean Harlow. She was new and just starting out and was trying to speak in the way she was taught by the studio. Spencer said something to the effect of, don't speak like that, speak in your natural voice, and it worked beautifully for her. Too bad Spencer hadn't been around to give Jack this advice prior to redemption. Let's get back to Mayer. Now, there are several things in motion in the late 1920s that come together in a horrible way for Jack Gilbert. One, he is offered a nice contract from United Artist that would have been a very good opportunity for Jack, and I think, had he taken it, would have changed his life completely. However, also at this time, Fox and MGM are planning a merger. This is a tenuous time, and what they do not want is to lose their number one star. Therefore, they offer Jack an even bigger contract to the tune of $250,000 a picture in a six-picture deal, which is a huge amount of money in that day, to keep him at MGM. They also promise that Louis B. Mayer is on his way out. Now, this right here is where Jack's career mistake is made. It's not the talkies. It's not Louis B. Mayer. It's not his voice. 
It's his signing of this contract with MGM, and I will tell you why. John makes a couple films under his new contract, Love being one of them. Everything is going swimmingly. Then several things happen in succession. Number one, talkies are ushered in as the new way to do films. Number two, the stock market crashes. And number three, the merger falls through. Now, Louis B. Mayer is not on his way out. The studio loses money in the stock crash and is now financially unstable because of losing the merger. What does this mean for Jack? Well, he has a target on his back now with that huge contract. MGM realizes they now have to start converting to talkies. However, they are a little late to the parade and they don't have the expertise or best equipment to make a good talkie. Nevertheless, they have a star that they need to put in a movie. So they chose Redemption, an odd choice for a story and an even odder choice for director, Lionel Barrymore, who has very little directing experience. How little experience? Well, basically, he's credited as directing two movies prior to Redemption. Perhaps they are trying to save money. Regardless, between Jack's unnatural voice, poor sound recording, an inexperienced, at best, director, and some possibly deliberate bad cutting, this film was so awful that it was immediately shelved, and instead, Jack was to make His Glorious Night, 1929. Again, the most important talking debut of their biggest male star, they choose Lionel Barrymore to direct. This makes little sense considering he was actually pulled off redemption and replaced because he was so horrible. As a matter of fact, in her biography, Dark Star, Beatrice Gilbert Fountain points the finger right at Lionel Barrymore for the disaster that was his glorious night. She paints him as riddled with arthritis, completely out of it from a morphine addiction, and basically incompetent at best and deliberately sabotaging at worst. There are numerous quotes from actors from this time backing up this point of view. For example, a quote from Louise Brooks. Quote, Barrymore was taking heavy doses of morphine in those days and was hardly responsible for what went on. Anyone could have manipulated him and someone did. It was common talk at the studio before the picture came out. Everybody knew it but Jack. End quote. Louise Brooks quote from Dark Star by Latrice Gilbert Fountain. It was mostly suggested higher powers were manipulating Lionel. The result was dis disastrous for Jack. The dialogue is flat out absurd and no one could have read it without getting the same reaction from audiences. It was a very laughable affair. The question is, why was MGM, in a period where they needed to establish themselves, using its biggest box office draw in a junk talkie with a terrible director? Shouldn't they be using the same top-of-the-line directors as before, get their best scripts, their best sound equipment, best editors? The answer is simple. They wanted out of the John Gilbert contract. They did not want to pay him $250,000 a picture. They wanted to make Jack look ridiculous and wanted him to walk out on his contract or become so angry that he did something that would nullify the contract. Jack did neither. To add insult to injury, they wound up releasing this farce of a movie while Jack was away on his honeymoon with Ina Clare. He returned to find the movie was a failure. To make matters worse, they then dusted off and released Redemption. This also went over like a lead balloon, and now John Gilbert was fighting for his career. He continued to toe the line at MGM, taking on increasingly bad films, such as Way for a Sailor, 1930, which was so bad that director Sam Wood didn't even want credit on it. Jack did not help himself either. When things were going badly, he turned more and more to the bottle. He was already preconceived as having a drinking problem due to the long-ago divorce from Latrice Joy. As you can imagine, this was probably not the best time to be married to John Gilbert. He was generally mercurial to begin with, so it's not surprising that after a mere six months of marriage, Ina Clare would move out. They wound up getting divorced in 1931. It should also be added that there are allegations that MGM heads tried to get Ina Clare to extract a large amount of money from Jack in the hopes it would somehow force him to give up his contract at MGM. Not sure what the thinking was there. Ina Clare refused to do so. Jack's quote at the failure of the marriage is quite typical of him. Quote, Everyone naturally regrets a failure, and I regret that this marriage is ending in divorce. One thing is established, 
and that is the dignity of the lady who was Mrs. Gilbert. She has been more than fair in every way and refused all offers of a financial settlement from me. End quote. John Gilbert by Eve Golden. When he finally began to get some better roles, it became obvious that the previous bad movies had influenced the general public. He starred in a couple quality talkies, such as Gentleman's Fate, 1931, and especially The Phantom of Paris, 1931. Though he was having moderate acting successes, these movies were losing money, and now, being perceived by MGM as not even a box office draw in a good film, which was basically their own fault, they were desperate to get out of that contract. It was decided to put him in another poorly written movie, West of Broadway, 1931. There was little doubt in either Jack or Hollywood insiders' minds by now what was going on at MGM. Ralph Bellamy, who was in West of Broadway with Jack, states, quote, Jack told me that the studio put him in this picture hoping he'd refuse it and break his contract. Jack said, I'll do anything. I'll clean spittoons if those bastards tell me to until this contract is up, end quote. John Gilbert by Eve Golden. A critic from the Hollywood Herald astutely observed, quote, If it was the purpose of MGM to lead John Gilbert to the guillotine and end the waning popularity of one of the most popular stars the silver screen has ever known, then West of Broadway is a great success, end quote. Dark Star by Leatrice Gilbert Fountain. At this point, Jack took matters into his own hands. We remember that Jack started out as a writer. Therefore, he simply wrote his own screenplay. He also did have big friends at MGM, such as good friend Irving Thalberg, who could not have liked what was happening to Jack. Irving agreed to produce the film entitled Downstairs and actually assigned a quality crew, including Montebell, as a director. This film co-stars Paul Lucas, who went on to some later fame, Hedda Hopper, who famously became a feared and powerful columnist, and Virginia Bruce, a very young and inexperienced actress. Downstairs was a wonderful movie for Jack. He plays a charming con man who is thoroughly despicable, but still oddly likable. I believe Jack enjoyed playing a role so different than all of his leading men roles. Sadly, this film did not fare well with the public. Part of the issue may have been the competition from other films of that year, such as Grand Hotel, Red Dust, Freaks, Scarface, Red-Headed Woman, and numerous other very good films. Another factor would be new, younger leading men emerging, one example being MGM's Clark Gable. We have to remember now that Jack is in his 30s and has been making movies for about 15 years. He's still a great actor, just perhaps not the leading man audiences wanted to see anymore. Listen to John Gilbert's voice. It's your opportunity to make up your own mind. If you go to the website, you can see video clips from downstairs, which I hope you enjoy as much as I do. You tell me if you think his voice is high and squeaky. I do hope you also take note of Virginia Bruce, who played Anna in Downstairs because she became the fourth Mrs. Gilbert. Virginia Bruce, 1932 to 1934. Poor Virginia Bruce was no match at all for the romantic intensity of Jack. His romance with Virginia Bruce followed the same pattern as all of his previous affairs, wooing her with roses and gifts, squiring her around the town, most likely professing his love and devotion to her daily. Jack was a handsome, charming, intense guy, and one difficult to resist for even the most experienced woman. Jack wasted no time marrying her, and Virginia was happy to make a go of the marriage, even at the cost of her own budding career. She had quite a lot of potential to become a leading lady. If only we could have switched Latrice and Virginia in the order of marriages, I think Jack would have fared so much better. Jack was delighted with his wife's attitude, and not to mention the calm and tranquil nature of Virginia Bruce was very helpful for Jack. Sadly, though, as I just mentioned, Virginia Bruce was the right wife at the wrong time. She was young and wanted to go out to society parties, and Jack no longer was interested in that. He now struggled to get good films when they used to be showering him with great roles and the alcoholism was taking a huge toll on his health. Virginia paints a very disturbing and graphic picture of daily life with Jack. Quote, Sometimes he'd be awake drinking all night. Then, in the morning, he'd get me to throw him into the swimming pool so he could clear his head. He had bleeding ulcers. He used to throw up blood in the morning until he fainted. End quote. John Gilbert by Eve Golden. Virginia and Jack became proud parents of a daughter, Susan Ann Gilbert, in 1933. 
Sadly, the same cycle will repeat with this marriage, just as all the other marriages. Virginia obtained a divorce in 1934 relating almost the same issues as Latrice had, drunken fights and being verbally abused. Jack, as usual, blamed himself and said nothing against Virginia. Quote, It was my own fault, of course. I was bad. Who am I to suppose that I can go through life being arrogant and overstrung and expecting people to understand? End quote. John Gilbert, Eve Golden. Return of Greta Garbo. In 1933, Jack had finally finished his ill-fated contract with MGM. I believe he instinctively was putting himself on what would have been an excellent career path by talking with folks at Fox about directing. He had people at Universal interested in this possibility also, but this was derailed by an opportunity sent his way by his old flame, Greta. Greta was due to star in a movie called Queen Christina. She had been having trouble in recent years finding a leading man with the same sort of spark she had with John Gilbert. She was not pining away after him or carrying some torch for him. She simply felt they had good on-screen chemistry, not to mention Jack had always been helpful in directing her in their pictures together. She may have also felt some obligation to help him as he was instrumental in helping her in her career. Regardless of her intent, this was not a good career move for Jack for these reasons. Number one, he would again have to sign a contract with MGM in order to make this picture. <laughs> Even worse, it was a seven-year contract where he would be paid by picture with the rights to turn down any pictures he didn't wish to do. Of course, if he turned down those pictures, he wouldn't be paid. Very oddly, it didn't occur to him, despite the fact they had done this before, that MGM might only offer him horrible pictures that he would want to turn down. Number two, Louis B. Mayer was still in charge at MGM. Number three, he was really no longer a leading actor. The best career choices for him at this time should have been directing or going into character acting. The public had made it quite clear they were not interested in John Gilbert as leading man. He had started on the path of becoming a director, and this contract kept him from following that path. Nevertheless, Jack humbly went into MGM, apologized quite nicely to Louis B. Mayer for past behavior, gratefully signed a contract well below his worth as an actor, and gracefully accepted minimal accommodations. Upon seeing Greta again, Jack was nervous and awkward. There was nothing more than friendly politeness and professional courtesy. John himself explains... Quote, I knew what she had done and why she had done it. I felt she felt that I had helped her a little once. She wanted now to help me. She was making a gracious gesture toward someone of whom she had been a little fond. End quote. John Gilbert by Eve Golden. A little fond is hardly the same as the great love of her life, but it's likely the truth. There was absolutely not even a hint of rekindling any long lost dead romance. Greta herself was quoted saying dismissive things when speaking of her past romance with Jack. Specifically, she is quoted in several biographies as saying to Salka Vertel, upon seeing Jack driving by, quote, Heavens, what did I ever see in him? End quote. There is a book called Garbo, Her Story, written by Antoni Gronowitz, claiming to be made of sentiments from Miss Garbo herself. Antony claims to have been a friend and lover to Greta. Despite his claims that she collaborated with him on this book, it is still officially called an unauthorized memoir, and it is filled with such personal and controversial items that I can't honestly imagine the very private Greta Garbo consenting to such a book. It notably was published after both Antony's and Greta Garbo's death, so I hesitate to even use this as a resource. But I would make note that the attitude in this book is also very dismissive of John Gilbert, often being mean-spirited. While I refuse to rely on this source solely, when read in conjunction with John Gilbert biographies and more legitimate Greta Garbo biographies, there definitely comes across a diminishing of their romantic relationship. Therefore, I do believe the quote repeated by Salka Vertel was accurate. At any rate, Jack was always considered professional when it came to his acting and got for the picture despite feeling nervous and awkward and that all MGM crew was against him. They did put him in a ridiculous wig in this role, which wasn't especially helpful to his image. 
Even so, he still put forth a good performance, but this wasn't the role for a comeback. This film is all about Greta Garbo, made even more so by the notices for the film, focusing almost completely on Greta, with Jack's name in small letters underneath the film title. One would think, to promote the public's interest, they would have wanted to play up the reunion. Not surprisingly, given this, along with the fact that the subject matter was most likely not overly interesting to the general public, the film lost money. MGM had several films lined up for Jack should Queen Christina prove a success, but once it failed, no more film offers were forthcoming. Jack's lawyer filed suit to void Jack's contract on the basis that they weren't offering him films. Rather than contest the lawsuit, MGM allowed the contract to lapse. This didn't help Jack all that much because film offers weren't coming in from other sources either. Jack thought to return to the path of directing, which had been open to him prior to Queen Christina. However, the folks in Hollywood were now aware that his health was failing. Years of alcoholism were quickly catching up to him. Producers were fearful of their budgets and needed very reliable folks to direct. This was somewhat unfair to Jack, who throughout his entire career, despite being an alcoholic, was well known for his professionalism. He didn't come to set late, he always knew his lines, and he did not cause delays in productions. Regardless, the perception remained that Jack's health was too precarious to make him a director. John Gilbert's Last Chance after being released from his MGM contract, Jack's plight came to the attention of Harry Cohn, head of Columbia Pictures. Cohn himself despised Louis B. Mayer. In fact, Louis B. Mayer was despised by many and thought it would be a good trick to revive Jack's career and bring him back to the great box office star he once was. However, he wanted Jack to keep himself out of trouble and out of booze as much as possible. He then went on to put Jack in a cast full of heavy drinkers in a role where he played an alcoholic. It's a bit much to then expect Jack to stay on the bandwagon. Crew on the film recall Jack being drunk all the time and when not drunk, extremely sick. On top of this, the movie was another box office failure for John Gilbert, and this was the end of his career at Columbia. Marlene Dietrich, Can She Save John Gilbert? There is something to be said about John Gilbert the person. Certainly, he was quick-tempered, high-strung, easily subject to anger, jealous, insecure, and prone to long bouts of depression. This is before we even mention the alcoholism. He fits quite well into the description of someone suffering from bipolar disorder, in those days known as manic depressive, but rarely diagnosed except in extreme cases such as Vivian Lee. Despite all this, throughout all his biographies, he is repeatedly touted by almost one and all, obviously Louis B. Mayer accepted, as being likable, a nice guy, a good guy, professional, and kind. There are quotes from the lowest people on the set to the highest executives in the studios in this vein. It's also the same with all of his ex-wives, who would have borne the brunt of those unfortunate bad personality traits. They generally seem to regard him with fondness and perhaps a great deal of pity. My point, I suppose, is we can probably say John Gilbert was a genuinely good person and quite well liked. In 1935, even at the age of 38, he was still very handsome and had lost none of his legendary charm. And where the movie studios may have failed him, women did not. Notably, one particular woman, a strong-willed German and an established actress with Paramount, Miss Marlene Dietrich. Marlene was quite determined to save Jack from himself. She plucked him from despair, forced him to leave his home, he was practically becoming a recluse, and brought him back to the lifestyle that he had in the mid-1920s, socializing, going out on the town, playing golf, and attending Hollywood parties. She was also determined to get him back into the movies. She had no doubt of his abilities and was the first one to realize what should have been realized long ago, that Jack was now more suited for character roles. To that end, she made arrangements to have him cast in her upcoming film entitled Desire. Indeed, Paramount agreed to cast him as Carlos Margoli in the film. Jack was now quite happy with his two favorite things, acting in films and being in love. It was not to be. Inevitably, his unhealthy lifestyle had finally caught up with him. He suffered a heart attack while swimming, and though he tried to downplay the matter, Paramount felt this was quite sufficient 
to remove Jack from the picture. Though he did come to visit Marlene on the set to support her, he quickly reverted back to his reclusive ways. He could not have felt well. He had recently been reunited with his first daughter, Latrice Gilbert, and his letters speak of feeling ill. It seems he may have suffered another attack on January 2, 1936, but recovered enough to leave his house on little outings and to see his daughter. Nevertheless, he was still ill enough to be assigned a home nurse, and Marlene would also come and care for him. But Jack had run out of time. On January 9th, he seems to have suffered a final, fatal heart attack, his last words allegedly being, Gee, but I'm awfully sleepy, before he drifted off into a sleep from which he would not awaken. I'd like to leave you with this letter that John Gilbert sent to his daughter, Latrice Gilbert. It doesn't specify the exact date, but based on her statements in Dark Star, I believe it to be somewhere in late 1934. This was the beginning of their reunion. This is the letter from her book. Darling Tinker, receiving your letter was the nicest thing that ever happened to me. I had hoped you would write to me someday, just as I had hoped that one day you will want to find out what kind of bloke this father of yours is. So when you decide to come around, please do. I assure you, we'll have fun. I have been very ill, Angel, so ill in fact that I cannot write this letter myself, but I am slowly recovering. If all goes well, I leave in about three weeks for New York to do a play. It is an entirely new adventure for me, and to be truthful, I am scared to death. So have a good wish for me, darling. I am sorry about Laddie Jack. If you would like to have another dog, I will send you one, or a dozen, but I must say my experience with them has been unfortunate. They were either stolen or poisoned or ran away or died. I know we must all die someday, but to learn to love a doggy for so short a time and then to have disaster fall is too much. However, let me know how you feel about it. Scotties are the most aristocratic of dogs. I was delighted to read the letterhead on your stationery, Latrice Joy Gilbert. I had heard stupid rumors about changing your name. Give my love to your sweet mama and for yourself, if you want it, keep all my heart. Daddy. I think that says all we need to know about John Gilbert. This is the end of John Gilbert, His Rise and Fall, with special credit to MGM. Please subscribe to my podcast, like and share. And again, please check out the video clips on my blog, Classic Film, Montgomery Clift, and other great actors. I'll see you at the next podcast.